Okay, Be'ezrat Hashem, Na'ase V'Natzliya. I want to welcome you to Beacon Tower Hollandale Lunch and Learn. Long time. We haven't been over here, but Hashem, we're over here with a limited minyam, just a handful of people with their masks off their faith. Maybe they should be back on the faith. It's up to you guys. But Baruch Hashem, we're here finally. We left the houses, we left the, the computer screens, and we're back again trying to learn. Uh, we've been do, doing this for several years now. We don't want to get it, you know, we don't want it to, uh, to just fizzle away. But Zat Hashem, we'll see if we'll add the Zoom platform to it, or if we'll continue. But Baruch Hashem, we're here. So now that we're here, I'd like to give an honorable mention to the people that are in the room. First of all, I want to thank uh, H&M Builders, Joseph and the Dornbush family for allowing us the use of the space and, uh, and for Judah Mendel for uh, pioneering this class and keeping it together and once again taking care of all the goodies that we need to come uh, for all the people that are here for the lunch and lunch. Hashem Vayichotchem, Samechotchem, continued health, wealth, success, happiness, Brachan and Tzachan, all you do, Be'ezat Hashem, you go higher and higher in your Chaniyut, Bli Yerida, without going down. Also, uh, Isaac for allowing us also to be over here and accommodating us. All the best to you. And also we have our good friend over here. How should I call you? Yaakov. You like Yaakov now? Okay, Yaakov, straight from Israel, joining us over here. After years of learning, he's going to come. Let's see if, uh, if we can uh, still impress you here in Miami, Florida. Okay, let's get started. So, even though that this is a, a Parashat Shavua class, and this will be, amen, and this will continue to be a Parashat Shavua class, I felt that in order to just get started, it's always to, uh, good to speak about something that is very relevant. Something that we can actually feel in, this, uh, in, in the Parashiot. Uh, so this, I'm going to draw from Parashat Pinchas, which we just finished, but in reality, it's going to be over the scope of the past few parashiyot that we've been going through. Uh, if you allow me to maybe give an arch, I'm sorry, an arc of between Baalotecha all the way to Pinchas, we have many, many different parashiyot over there. And from there, from the minute of Sefer Bamidbar, we see over there that there was a lot of different situations. A lot of different groups of people, a lot of different movements, a lot of different uh, protests. We had uh, the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude, and their claim of wanting to go back to Egypt for the food, for, 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 for being in the, in the desert was too difficult. We had the Mit Onenim, the ones that complained. They complained about the food, they wanted the meat, they wanted the fish, they wanted to, again, go back to Egypt. We had the Meraglim, we had the... the, the the spies who came back with a negative report about the Eretz Yisrael and said, no, you know, let's go back to Egypt. Imagine, they're right there at the footsteps of Israel. The, the land is bad, the, the giants are there, they're going, we look like small little grasshoppers in their eyes. Let's go back to what we know, let's go back to Egypt. Then we had an, an additional conflict of Korach and Adaton. Korach were 250 of the top men of that generation going against Aharon and Moshe and their uh, and their positions within society. Last week we had Zimri ben Salu that uh, went with the Midianit princess, Kozbi Batsum, and we see that the whole thing again, we had a, a, a conflict of Zimri going against Moshe Rabbeinu saying, how come you can marry Tsipora and I can't marry Kozbi? And many, many different conflicts and the way that they added, which at the end, of it, at the end every single one of them ended in death. Whether it's fire, whether it's a plague, whether it's the ground opening up, whether it's a, a javelin through the center of their body. Almost every single movement against the Torah, its leaders, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and Eretz Yisrael all ended in death. Now, there was many different reactions by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to this. Right now, let's see how Hashem reacts when things go wrong in Am Yisrael. So, if you, were asked, if you were to ask any first grader, what was the worst sin that the Jews ever did? You would say? 
Cheta Eged. See, his real yeshiva does you good. Cheta <laughs> Eged, the golden calf. How could it be? How could it be? The Jews that saw the splitting of the sea, the ten plagues, they saw God, they pointed up to him. They saw the miracles in the desert, the, 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 the heavenly man, the, 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 the clouds of glory, the, the, the rolling rock, Be'er Miriam, Ma'amad Har Sinai, all these things. And just a few days later, they're worshiping a golden calf. What was God's reaction to it? In Parashat Kitisa, in Perek Lamed Bet, on Pasuk Tetz, it says, Vayomer Hashem and Moshe, Ra'iti ta'am azev, Minam k'shorifu, I saw this nation, it's a stiff-necked nation, Ve'ata, and now, Hanichali, let me be, Vayichar api bahem v'achalem, Let the wrath of my uh, anger uh, come upon them, and let me annihilate them, destroy them, Ve'eseh otcha l'goy gadol, Now make you to a great nation. So what we want to focus in on over here is God's reaction to the golden calf was Vaychar apo bahem. What's Vaychar apo bahem? Let my anger flare up against them and I shall annihilate them. Vaychar apo. In other words, if you were to think about the worst thing that could ever happen to the Jews, the worst sin that they did, God's reaction was Vaychar apo. Okay, let's continue to uh, when it talks about the Erev Rav and they were complaining, we see over there, when the, uh, the, the group of people were beginning to complain and Hashem was hearing their complaints, once again, we see that His wrath flared. Once again, Hashem was angry with them. Hashem sent a fire. And it burnt them. It burnt the mixed multitude that were the complainers. Hashem, you can see over here, not only does he not like idol worship, he also doesn't like complainers. He doesn't like people that had come with, with a, and their complaint was what? That they were walking too long. That they were tired. When they, that they that they wanted uh, watermelon and cucumbers and uh, and uh, and um, onions and garlic, and to go back to Egypt. We go down to Parashat Shelach, and of course there's many more events in between. I'm almost like just cherry picking the events in order to get to the point. But if you go to Parashat Shelach with the Miraglim, with the... Amen. With the spies in Perik Yudalet, on the first Pasuk it says... And we see that on that day they came and they started to complain again over the negative report that Hashem, uh, that the, uh, the spies gave on Israel. And we see that on that day, which happened to be, by the way, Tisha B'Av, it says, uh, on, on that night you cried, uh, you cried for naught, you cried for nothing. On Tisha B'Av, when you receive the news, you cry that Israel is bad. On Tisha B'Av, for generations and generations, I'm going to let you cry for something. Mm -hmm. And we know that on Tisha B'Av, first destruction, second destruction, so many times have happened between Shiva Sabet Tammuz and Tisha B'Av. But Tisha B'Av, what happened on Tisha B'Av is that the Miraglim spoke Rashon Hara on Eretz Yisrael. What was the fate of that nation? That ever, the fate of those people in the desert? That every single Jew from the age of 20 to 60, every Tisha B'Av would dig their grave, lie in it, and the following morning, those who died, you cover them with the sand, those who continued, move on to the next year. And they did that every year on Tisha B'Av, every year with Tisha B'Av. That's how you got 600,000 Jews to perish in the desert. That's Dor Hamidbar. But that's, we see that even when they spoke of Shon Hara, Hashem was angry at that as well. Oh, I'm sorry. And the, and the, and the suggestion that Hashem made, Dever, I will annihilate him with a plague. Dever is another word for, for plague. So you see, Lashon Hara and Yisrael, Hashem's reaction, let me, let me get rid of them with a plague. We continue down to... Uh, Perek Yudalet, 
In Pasuk Lamed Zayin, it says something there also very, very interesting. It says, Vayemutu anashim motze dibat ha'aretz ha'a b'magefa lifnei Hashem. Hashem created a plague and that's how they died. By the way, do you know how they died also, the Meraglim themselves? The Meraglim, the, the way that they died is their tongue came all the way down, swollen down to their belly button, and then worms came up. And you know why that is? Because the Lashon that spoke Lashon Hara about the belly button of the world, Eretz Yisrael is the belly button of the world. Wow. If you see uh, Eretz Yisrael, there's a Bet HaMikdash, underneath Bet HaMikdash, there's Evan Ashtia. Evan Ashtia is a special stone that over there is the, 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 the beginning of time, the beginning of, of, of the world. That Kadosh Baruch Hu stepped on that stone and then the world started to be built around it. And that is, they say, you spoke about uh, 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 the belly button of the world, you're going to perish with the Tolaim on your, on your, um, on your tongue. Later on, we move on to Parashat Korach. Korach in Adato, we see Korach says, Moshe Rabbeinu, why should you be above all of us? Why should you be the king and your brother, the, the, the high priest, the chief rabbi of Israel? We're all holy. And in Perk Tetzayin, Pasuk Lamed Hey, what was Hashem's reaction? And fire came out and burnt out all those 250 men. And we know that also the ground split, uh, split open and they got swallowed into the ground. That was God's reaction to Korah and Adato. And later on in Parashat Balak, which is a parashat that we just read a couple of weeks ago, at the end of the parashat, it talks about Balak and Bilam that were trying, you know, enemies, sworn enemies of Eretz Yisrael that were unsuccessful at uniting and attacking the Jews, were unsuccessful at being able to wage any sort of physical or spiritual warfare because Bilam was a spiritual warfare. He was going to curse uh, Am Yisrael. He gives a free advice to the Midianim and says, you know what? We can't beat him through me. We can't beat him through a war. You can't beat him through uh, my cursing. The only advice that I can give you that Elohehem sone zima. The Jewish God hates promiscuity, hates lewdness. So taking that advice, the king of Midian plots a plan will, where he sends out to the Jewish people old women with trinkets in their hands, with necklaces, saying, two for five dollars, beautiful necklaces, beautiful uh, bracelets, two for five dollars. And the Jewish people are looking at it like, oh, wow, nice, beautiful goods, excellent price. And they're oh, if you like, right there, I have my tent. In my tent, I have a beautiful showcase with a lot more goods. I said, sure, why not? Maybe we'll make our wives happy, we'll make our children happy. They go over there, and all of a sudden, who's behind the showcase? An 18-year-old, really beautiful woman. And now they're showing her, the, they're showing her the, the, the jewelry. And as they get to talking, they're seducing the Jewish men, asking them to drink some wine. They're showing meat. Oh, we've been eating man all this time. Oh, look at the smell of the barbecue. Have some, eat with us. And you see, with the drinking and the eating, Finally, what happened? Their stomachs started to shift because they've been eating mud for a very long time there's no, and there's no waste with the mud. They never had to go to the bathroom. All of a sudden, they had to go to the bathroom. As soon as they, had to, they felt the, the urge to go, they took out the Baal Peor and said, do it in front of him. Defecate in front of my God and you'll be with me. And they fell for it. They defecated in front of the Baal Peor and they sinned. So on that... Parashat Balak, the last Aliyah, Perik Chafhet Pasuk Aleph, it says, Vayeshev Yisrael B'Shitim, Vayechel Am Niznot El Bnot Moab. And the Jewish people were sitting in an area called Shitim, and they started to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. Vatikren Al Am Lizifchel Eloen. And they tricked them, they say, Hey, you're sacrificed to my God. Just the way I just described to you uh, a moment ago. 
ויאכל העם, they ate, והשתחוו לאלוהים, they fell forward, they bowed, they worshiped that idolatry. ויצמד ישראל לבעל פאור, and now עם ישראל became close to the, Jew, to, the, to the Moab. How did they get close to them? They got close, they worshiped their God, they ate with them, they, break, they broke bread with them, they drank with them, they were with their daughters. What is the direct reaction of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Vayichar af Hashem b'Yisrael. There it is again. Vayichar af Hashem. Vayichar af Hashem. What does it say over there? The wrath of God flared up against them. Where did we see this Vayichar af? Where did we see it? Chet Aegel. Now look, the biggest sin that we thought could ever be done in the desert, we said, wow, oh, Chet Aegel. And what was the reaction? Vayichar af Hashem. But here we see that the exact same reaction was given when the Jewish people got connected to the, uh, Moab, uh, to the girls of Moab. So we see something very interesting. If you pay close attention to the Pasuk, it says over here, the, the, the woman uh, convinced the Jewish men to perform the, the Avodah Zarah. At that time, if, if that was so bad, right here and then, it should have said, oh, idolatry. No. No. Hashem said, well, okay, you know, they'll do Teshuvah. You go to the next part, it says, Vayochal ha'am v'yishtachu. They ate. Oh, maybe Hashem should be angry. Not kosher food. Maybe it's not kosher wine. Not only that, they're bowing. Vayishtachu to, 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 to the Baal Peor. Maybe right over here should be Vayichal uh, Hashem. Nothing. However, when it says, Vayitzamed Israel, and, and, and Israel became attached to the Midianim, what does it say? Vayichal of Hashem. All of a sudden, when it came to them getting close to the non-Jewish woman, the Moaviyot, Hashem became angry. Why? Why only when they got connected to the non-Jewish woman, Hashem became angry? All the other times, and we see there's other things that we just spoke about. The Miraglim, we spoke about the, uh, the, the Mitonenim, or we spoke about all these other uh, Korach and Adato. We didn't get that reaction, Vayichar Af. But yet here, we see that the wrath of God was going to come upon the Jewish people. Because they went with non-Jewish women. Okay. Pure, uh, the simple explanation is Elohehem Sone Zima. There's one thing you should know about God. He can't stand when a Jew acts lewd. He can't stand when a Jew acts promiscuous, not dressed properly, not behaving properly. Anything that has to do with sexual misconduct, God can't stand. Just like you can't stand the, 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 the golden calf on the same level. Furthermore, in Parashat Kitisa, in Perik Lamedalet, it says over there something else that will strengthen this point. It says, Parashat Kitisa is in Shemot, so it's a couple of books before this, but you can see that this concept has been brought up before. It says, Hishamer lecha pentichot brit lo sheva aretz asha ataba alia. Be careful not to uh, sign a, a treaty or a covenant with the people that are going to be in the land. Pen yelem kush bikirbecha. Before it becomes a, an obstacle. Let's see where. Lamedalet Yudbet.
before, before it becomes an obstacle in front of you. Okay. Keep met with Bechotam Titotun, Vemat Sevotam Tishavu, Betashev Tichotun. It gives us instruction over here to destroy their uh, monuments, to destroy their idolatry, to destroy anything that they worship. Hashem does not want us to worship any other idols or any idols in the, uh, at all. And the reason for, why? It says because Hashem is jealous. He is a jealous God. It's not the proper explanation that He's a jealous God because when it says Shemo El Kanahu, uh, we saw that Pinchas is also Kana. What's Kana? It was Kanai for Hashem. That he he was he wanted to stand up for what's right. I'll give you a different example. Even though even though that it, it can mean like that, the Malmlo says Ki Hashem kana shemo, that Hashem he is a jealous God. What would be the reason for it? He says because Am Israel is Am Segula. We are the chosen nation. And just like it says, Vayitem li segula It says that, that Hashem chose us as the chosen nation. And just like a man becomes jealous when his wife goes and speaks to a strange man, similarly, a Kadosh Baruch Hu, when the Jewish people go and worship Avodah Zarah, he becomes jealous. The same way. And, but it says over there, Pentichot b'it Hoshev Ha'aretz, v'zanu achare Elohem, v'zafu l'Elohem, v'kara l'cha v'achat amizimcho. Because when you are going to go wor worship their idolatry, they are going to go after their gods and they're going to go and they're going to eat from their sacrifices. And this is very, very interesting. If you look at the words over there, it says, Vezanu b'notav, that their girls are going to act promiscuously and will make banecha yiznu, and your, 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 your men or your boys will follow suit and will also act similarly. And when you follow their girls, eventually what, what happens? You're going to go after their gods. So there's a formula over here. The girls cause the boys to sin. The Gentile girls, the non-Jewish girls will, call, will cause the Jewish uh, men to sin. The, 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 the boys in, in return, Banecha is new. Your boys will also uh, act in a, in a lewd manner. And in return, the result of that will be Achare Elohem Yilechu. That they were going to go after their gods. And we learn from here that the woman has a lot of power. The woman has a lot of power when it comes to the man's spirituality. The woman has the power to sway a, a, a man away from his religion. And the reason for that is because the following pasuk that it says over here, it says, Elohim asecha Why would the following pasuk be, Ve'elohim asecha lo That right after it talks about how their women lure our boys to worship their men, and then the, the law of, Lo Elohim asecha. Because it leads to idol worship. So simply put, you go with a non-Jewish girl, she has the power to make you sin and to be lewd and promiscuous just like her, which in return makes uh, 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 results in you following their ways and the ways of their gods. And if you're not careful, you are going to eventually worship an idol. That's what these Pesukim tell us. It's very interesting because the Geret Ramban, you know, we just spoke about the Tum'ah, let's talk about the Kedusha part of it. The Geret Ramban, the letter that Ramban wrote to his son, says over there, Al titosh et torat imecha. It says, he gives a, a, a advice to his son not to neglect or not to leave behind the Torah of his mother. What do you mean? I, I don't know about you, but the Torah in my house comes from me, right? I teach my son Torah. So how can it be Torah Timecha? So it's very... It's something that you have to understand. The wife is the home. In a Gentile home and in a Jewish home. The wife is the home. 
The father is the one that teaches. Yes, I teach my children. Put on a kippah, put on a tzitzit. Shakon uh, yabidvaro, make a bracha, do chesed. Yes, I come home and I teach. The men come to, come to the house and they are the spiritual leaders. But the mother is the one that carries it out. You come, you, 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 you deposit your, your teaching of Torah, and then you go for 10 hours of work outside, and you come home again. For that whole time that you're not there, who implements the teaching? The wife. Because she's the one that's really teaching the children. You might give the direction, but she carries it out. Because the wife has the power in the home. The man is the head. The, the, the woman is the neck that moves it. Yeah? In intermarriage, woman has the power to lead man to abandon religion. When a Jewish man ends up with a Jewish woman, or vice versa, we've seen it before, because the Tuma is very strong nowadays as well, the woman has the power to lead the man and to abandon the religion. Where do we see that? If we go to Sefer Devarim, in Parashat Ve'et Hanan, we're going to be reading that parasha very soon. In, in Perik Zayin, it says, in Pasuk Gimel through Dalit, even maybe a, a, little, a little bit more. It says over there. Velotit Hatenba. Do not marry them. Bitcha Lotitan Ivno. Don't give your daughter to their sons. Uvito Lotikah Livincha. And their daughter don't take for your sons. Why? The following Pasuk tells you. Ki Yasir et Bincha Maharai. They're going to take his, your son and they're going to make him stray away from me, turn away from me. This is God speaking. And they're going to worship other gods. There's that word again. The wrath of God again. God's wrath will come again and he will uh, 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 destroy you quickly. Maher. So we're seeing over here clear instruction of the result of intermarriage. It lets us even know what happens. What happens when a boy, a Jewish boy and a Jewish girl go with a, a Gentile. That eventually they're going to lead them away from God, away from the religion. And the result of that is the wrath of God once again comes into the world and Hashem wants to destroy the people. And quickly, you know, the, the, the Torah doesn't mince words. That word maher did not need to be here. Hashem could have just said, and He will destroy you. Maher means that Hashem doesn't want to waste any time. He wants to get rid of, of that cancer in the world when people are intermarrying. I did a little bit of research a while back. It seems like that research still holds. I didn't see anything recent as of yet, but Pew Research as of 2013, seven years ago. Here's the numbers from seven years ago. Is that 58% of American Jews intermarry. And for non-Orthodox Jews, non-Orthodox Jews, 71% intermarry. Those are very, very high numbers. Those are very, very high numbers. And that's from seven years ago. I can tell you, things got worse. Things got worse. Some have even called it the second Holocaust. The first Holocaust, many people try to give reasoning of what. Nobody knows what it is except for God. Many rabbis have come out and said certain things that make you understand that it could be possible like this, could be possible like that. It's not for this class. But one of the reasons was assimilation, intermarriage. 
a lot of what happened in Europe is that they became more German than Jews. German first, Jews second. And at that point, the numbers were that there was 50% of the Jews in Europe were uh, assimilating or into marriage. The study from seven years ago is way higher here in the United States. Way higher. We have millions of Jews that don't acknowledge themselves as Jews. There are people over here, I, I've met people with the name Cohen or, or Davis or Green. Or Soros. Or Soros that are completely, completely don't uh, acknowledge themselves as Jews. They just carry that last name. You have millions of kids raised as non-Jews. The mother is Jew, the father is not, uh, the mother is a Jew, the father isn't, or vice versa. And they're not spiritual, religious, or affiliated. And you see a whole generation of millions of Jewish kids that are not being raised as Jews. And as of lately, close to over a million, just in the United States, close to a million converted out of Judaism. Why? Because they're not really knowledgeable about the religion, not connected yet. Yeah. Look at it. Did they have as much? It was 680,000, 630, 680,000 as of seven years ago. Seven years have passed. There's people on the campuses where they're doing their work, they're doing their messianic duties, and they're able to pluck Jews and convert them. Big movements, deep pockets, great marketing. Intermarriage and assimilation has done a serious damage on the Jews in the diaspora, especially in the United States. Especially. I can tell you right now that I know many people, personally, that have fell for the trap. Good people, good Jews, good friends, that are right now in that situation and it's very hard to get out of it. Some people are just starting, some people are have started already in it with children and you see the different areas of this the, the, the different stages of Jews when they go through this intermarriage and assimilation and it's tough to watch now even though that we're discussing something as recent as uh, today even early in Jewish history we see that the Avot and the uh, emot, the, the, the matriarchs and the patriarchs were very concerned and worried about this very subject we're speaking about. In Bereshit, Abraham had an, a servant, an assistant, Eliezer, that he basically gave him everything to control. Everything. He was not only his house servant, he almost is the, was the one that inherited all of Abraham's uh, belongings if he wasn't going to have children. That, the, that Abraham was worried and said to Hashem, am I going to be inherited by my servant Eliezer? He had control of everything. He had the keys to the business. He had the keys to all his money. Yet, when he gave him the task of going to find uh, a wife for his son Yitzhak, what did he tell him? Swear to me. Swear to me that you're not going to take from, uh, from B'not Kenan. So, it's, it's very interesting. You trust him with everything that's yours. What are you making him swear? You, you trust him with everything. He's Eliezer, the, 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 you know, the, the, the honest servant of Abraham Avinu. Why swear? You know why? Because even though Eliezer is controlling everything that belongs to Abraham, but Abraham says, wait, wait, up until the kids, up until the family, everything is good. I trust you with everything. But when it comes to my son, you swear to me that you're not going to give me a, a Canaanite woman. You swear to me that you're going to keep the word that you're going to give me a, a, a girl from this house that I'm sending you to. Why? Because he was concerned about intermarriage. He was concerned about which woman was going to come into the house. Later on, we see Yaakov 
Yaakov had the instruction to go where? Lech de Lavan. Go to your mother's brother's house. Go to Lavan. Why? I want you to marry family. Anything? No, not only. I want you to marry family. I want you to marry from the house of Lavan. And specifically, not Benot Kenan. The Avot were very concerned of who the, their children was going to end up with. And even, even internally, in the family we see these examples. Yitzchak and Rivka had twin boys, Yaakov and Esav. Yaakov was a tzaddik. Esav was a rasha. <laughs> He's right up there as one of the most wicked people to ever live. And Rasha that lived in the house opposite his brother. They shared a home. They shared a room. And there's no more bad influence on a person than Esav. Everything that he does is bad. You hang around and you tell, me who you, tell me who your friends are. I'll tell you who you are. Tell me who's your company. I'll tell you what you're going to be. <laughs> Imagine your twin brother is Asad. You're going to pick up something from him. They didn't say anything. Not to Asad and not to Yaakov. They left it alone. However, when Asad brought his wives into the house, that was the red line. If you go to Parashat Poldot, Sefer Bereshit in Chavzain, the language there is so harsh, is so harsh from the parents. Perek Chavzain, Pasuk Memvav, it says over there, Vatome Rivka and Yitzchak, these are two parents. Rivka and Yitzchak are talking about their own children. And she says, she says, I am disgusted with my life on account of the daughters of Chet. If my son Yaakov is going to take a wife from these women, from Bnot Chet, I'd rather die, his mother says. I'd rather die than see my child take a non-Jewish girl. You see, Yitzchak calls his son, he blesses him, and then he commands him. Do not take from the woman of Canaan. Benot Canaan is another way of saying a Gentile girl. Go take from the daughters of Lavan, the brother of your, uh, of your mother. So you see that even, even in our homes, in our family, if a brother or a son or an uncle or a, or a cousin takes, takes somebody who's not Jewish, you have to be very, very careful. Why? Because what could the guy say? But my cousin, but my brother, he married a non-Jew, everything is okay. Over here we see Tzchak and Rivka says, she'd rather die than go through a story like that. Another interesting story. The story of Esav, Yaakov, and Dina. Once again, Esav, he's the wicked one. And we know that Yaakov married two, uh, two sisters, Rachel and Leah. Rachel belonged to Yaakov. Leah was supposed to go to Esav. But because she prayed so hard, Hashem listened to her prayers, and she ended up marrying the tzaddik. This goes to show the power of tefillah. Just goes to show also, somebody who prays on somebody can change the zivug. 
There's, pe there's people that say, you know, that the, the person, when he prays on a zivug, be careful that somebody else doesn't pray harder. <laughs> a, a, a person's zivug can be taken away if the other person prays harder. But we see over here that Esav was supposed to be with Le'ah. Le'ah had the power. But that's a shame that we merit to understand how to pray harder. Esav was supposed to be married to Leah. She prayed not to be with him. And it was, in a way, a mistake. Why? Because Leah had the power to flip him. She had the power to flip Esav to a tzaddik. Since it didn't happen with her, there was another woman that had the power to take Esav and flip him into a tzaddik. Who was it? Her daughter, Dina. Leah's daughter, Dina, also had the power to flip Esav into a tzaddik. And the story goes like this. After Yaakov runs away from his brother because he wanted to kill him, and he comes back after a period of time with uh, four wives, 12 kids, all the, all, the, uh, all the sheep and all the livestock that he had with him. Yaakov is very worried about who? His only daughter, Dina. He says, maybe he's upset at me. Maybe he wants to kill me. Or maybe he's going to put his eye on my daughter, Dina, and he's going to want her. And I don't want my daughter to be with that mobster. I don't want my daughter to be with that Tersha. Even though he's my brother, I know who he is. So he wanted to protect his daughter from his brother. Ended up what? That he got punished from a Kadosh Baruch Hu because of that. Why? Because he should have offered his daughter to Esau. Why? Because she too had the power to flip him to Tzaddik. She too had the power just like her mother. They said that Esau had the power of Mashiach. Why? He knew the depths of the Tum'ah. He knew how to go into the deepest, darkest, most evil, most twisted Tum'ah that's in the world. He was second, uh, his angel is the Samich Mem. Could you imagine? There's nobody that knew the other side better than Esau. If he got switched around, you know the Tikkunim that he could do? He knows exactly where to go and when to fix it and bring it back. We missed that opportunity with Asaf. Every generation is an opportunity for uh, Mashiach. And each one has a different ability to fix. Asaf had the ability to fix everything that was in the Tum'ah, like Dusha. Had he had the right woman. If it was with Lea, if it was with Dina. Now, Dina had the power also. She also was a very powerful woman. She had the power to convert a person. How do we know that? Shechem, Shechem, the Gentile, she was able to convince him to circumcise himself and the whole town along with him. Wow, what power. Not only that, she had the power to what? If she was with Esau, to convert him into a full tzaddik. The women have a lot of power in swaying a person's spirituality. A lot of power. Whether it's for Kedusha, or whether it's for Tumah. Now, we see that even to family, we have to make wise decisions. It's not so simple. It's not always the stranger out there that you have to be careful of. It's also within the family. There's a... You know, a lot of people say, ah, oh, but you know, the zivug, it's so tough. In Miami, the market is dry, there's no girls, there's no quality girls, it's not what I'm looking for. Oh, the Gentiles, it's so easy with them. I click with them so, so easy, everything goes so smoothly. I have such much of a better uh, energy with them. Instead of trusting that a Kadosh Baruch Hu, 
has a zivug for every person and he brings it at the right time. The classic example is Dina's daughter. Dina's daughter was Osnat. Osnat was a product of a rape. When Dina was raped by Shechem, she got pregnant. And when she got pregnant, the daughter that came from that pregnancy was Osnat. And the reason she's called Osnat because she she was hated by her family. Why? Because every time they look at her, oh, you're that black story, that black mark on our, on our family story. Every time we look at you, we see that Shechem and what he did to you, they couldn't stand to see her around. It was a constant reminder of a bad story in the, in the family's history. So Yaakov Avinu said, you know what, you need to go away. And he wrote for her an amulet. And the amulet, he says, this is Hosnat, the daughter of Dina, from the house of Yaakov. And he put it for her over there. He says, wear this on your neck. And she went and she got adopted by who? Potiphar. Potiphar. She got adopted by Potiphar. That's why when Potiphar's wife wanted Yosef so bad is because when they looked into the constellations, when they were doing the Avodah Zarah, the astrology, she says, it says that I'm supposed, my house is supposed to be with Yosef. That's right, not you, your daughter. When she saw that she, Yosef belonged to her, that's why she felt so wholeheartedly about pursuing him, is that she read it wrong. Yosef does belong to your house, but not you, the daughter that you adopted. And the way that it happened is that Yosef was so beautiful that when people would, when he would walk by, people would throw trinkets, the woman would throw trinkets at him. They would, they would yell out his name. They would, they'd be mesmerized by him. One time Osnat was there and she took her amulet and she threw it on him. And he catches it and he opens it up and he says, I am Dina, the daughter of Dina. I am Osnat, the daughter of Dina from the house of Yaakov. In the middle of Mitzrayim, in the middle of all the Tum'ah, the only two Jews, some way, somehow, find themselves and get married. When Hashem wants a zivuk to happen, it's going to happen. And even though he could be around a million Gentile girls, the one Jew comes straight to him. Now, I want to come back to the story of Pinchas. You know what, I'll give you another story of how a person's zivug will come to him. A person's zivug, when it's yours, it's yours. Just stay on the right way, at the right time. Be'ito, what's Be'ito? Knowing. Sometimes people think, oh, I'm ready right now, I'm ready right now. But you know what? Maybe you're not ready right now. Maybe right now you will ruin the zivug. Maybe right now you're not ready for it. Or maybe she's not ready for it. Or maybe you're too much seesaw. Uh, holy, uh, not holy. Keeping, not keeping. Torah Jew, not Torah Jew. What happens? Each time you go higher and lower, a different zivug is, is the appropriate zivug for you. It's good to stay steady, steady, going up steady, steady, so like that your zivug matches you and the gym puts it together. But when a person peaks and dips, Peaks and dips, the zivu goes, ooh, 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 how many of It's like a roller coaster. Each one is going in a different direction. I'll give one other story. It's a famous story that was told many, many, many times. I'll just say it quickly. I think even repeated it in, in this class several times. It's a story of a girl that was attacked by uh, uh, a couple of uh, Arabs in Israel. And they tried to snatch her gold necklace. And there was this guy over there, well, you know, maybe a teenager that saw this, and he went and he went to go help her. And when he went to go help her, they slashed his face with a knife. And when they slashed his face, they ran away. She got saved. She ran away to her family, and she got taken away to, to the hospital. And that was it. That was the event. Years later, it was a good yeshiva boy. He got to the age of marriage, 20, and you know, getting to the time of Shiduchim. And every time he went on a date, it would be great. They'd vibe, they'd have a great connection, but there was never a second date. Never a second date, never a second date, never a second date. And he knew why. It was that huge scar on his face. 
The girls couldn't get past it. They loved speaking to him. He had a great personality, but they always told him, you know, I don't think you're the right one for me. He went to the rabbi. I'm pretty sure it's a very big rabbi. I just don't know his name in order to uh, mention him right here, but I think it's, it's a pretty big name, rabbi. And he told him, rabbi, you know, I want to get married. I want to start a family. Uh, I'm going on a lot of dates, a lot of dates. And it always starts very good. But at the end, I never get a second date. And he goes, and I know what it is. He says, it's because of the scar on my face. What should I do? So the rabbi told him, go on a date. Keep going on a date. He says, but the next time, as soon as you sit down, the first thing that you talk about is a scar on your face. He says, are you sure, rabbi? He says, yeah, the first thing that you do, you should speak, you speak about the scar on your face. So wouldn't you know, the next date, he goes on, they sit down, he tells, uh, listen, nice to meet you, but before we continue, I want to tell you about the scar on my face. He says, when I was younger, I was a kid, I, uh, I saw this girl being attacked by a couple of Arabs, and uh, I went to stand up for her, because they were trying to snatch her gold necklace away, and while I was fighting with them, one of them slashed me with a knife, and, uh, you know, and I went to the hospital, and since then, I've had this scar, and all of a sudden, she starts to cry. She starts to cry, she starts to cry. He's like, listen, I didn't mean to upset you. It's just a story, that's what happened. The rabbi told me I should say it first so there's no awkwardness and you don't stare at it the whole time, you just think about it. She's like, that's not why I'm crying. She's like, the reason why I'm crying is because my whole life I've been waiting for you to say thank you to you. I'm that girl that you saved. I'm that girl that you saved and you jumped in and I've been waiting my entire life to come, it, 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 uh, to come and say thank you to you. And as a matter of fact, you know what happened? They hit it off. They won a second date. Second date, <laughs> got married, and it was from Shamayim. Wow. When a person Shiduch comes, it says Shiduch. Okay. It might be tough, it might be... Uh, takes time, but good things come to those who wait. But let's go back to the intermarriage of our, of our class. It says the Parashat Pinchas, something very interesting. This is what actually what caught my attention and this is the reason of this whole introduction of this whole class right now was for this. In Parashat Pinchas, it says, if you recall during the time that the 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 Midian Yot went into the t into Eretz, into uh, into Am Israel, and we see that uh, a lot of them sinned with them, and we also had the story of Zimri and Salu, and Pinchas went and he stood up. He says, "This can't be. After everything, after the Beraglim, after Korah, after the uh, after the uh, Erev Rav, after all that's going on, all the complaining. Now there's this thing again. I can't stand it anymore. Going against the Rabbis, going against the Torah, going against the Shem. He says, I'm going to go stand up for what's right.' And he stops." He stops them in the middle of their action. Imagine they were doing that in public. He went and he stopped them. Why? Because there was a plague. Hashem also had an up. He says, I can't do this anymore. And, and, and the plague started to kill people. And as people are dying, everybody was getting nervous. Pinchas went and stopped it by killing Zimri and Kozbi. And it says over there, 24,000 people died in that Magifah. And then it says, It says, It was after the plague. And these words right away ring, rang in my ear to say, there's a reality where it's the end of a plague. There's a reality that you can stop a plague. We are now in the midst of a plague. We are now in the midst of a Makkah. We're in the midst of Corona. And many reasons have been given to why we are experiencing this plague worldwide. We've heard them uh, mention about talking in shul, cover your mouth, lashonara, hearing it, speaking it. Uh, it's an opportunity for all this time off to get close to Hashem. 
that all this extra time was to take away all the busy schedule that we have in order for us to get closer to Kadosh Baruch Hu. Or, you know, we keep hearing social distancing, you know, everything has to do with uh, staying away from one another. It seems like our social values have changed. So Hashem wants us to social distance ourselves. We know that lately, if you look at the way we interact, the way we socialize, it changed a little bit. It's not like it was before. You meet somebody, you actually have to physically go to a place, meet somebody, interact with one another. The way that we socialize nowadays has changed. It's a lot more impersonal, but we do a lot more of it. And the way that we do it, which is through our phones, tablets, computers, have become a venue for evil speech. Tons of Lashon on all the social media platforms. Tons of Sin'ah, hatred on, on social media and, on the social, and all those social media platforms. So much hatred is out there and it's amplified because even if just 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people are doing it, millions of people are watching it. Also, the Shmirat and the things that our eyes have seen or see on a daily basis, you put 10 generations together before us, they would never see the things that we see nowadays. If you take 10 generations from the 1800s up until the 2000s, they would never see what we see in a day. Put yourself on Facebook, you can see the whole world and back, good or bad, whatever you want. The Shmirat and is very, very difficult. What our eyes see and process on a daily basis is, is way more than what any generation before has done before. Not to mention the zima that is in these devices. What we say about the zima, Elohim sone zima. God can't stand lewdness, promiscuity. Reason for this plague, Hashem wants to reset the world. To bring the honor back to the corona. To bring the honor back to the what? What's corona in Spanish? To the crown. Bring the honor back to the crown. Bring the honor back to Hashem. Well, today I'd like to suggest another reason for corona. Another reason of why we're going through something like this. Another reason why there is uh, a magifa. Intermarriage and assimilation. We see that when there is intermarriage and assimilation, what is God's reaction? Vaychar af Hashem. The wrath of God comes. And how? Quickly. What happened? Wars take a long time. Diseases take a long time. It seems like Corona took over the world. Quickly. Similarly to what we just learned today. Hashem's reaction is identical. The method of, of punishment is identical. And where do we see that? When the Jewish people, when they get close to the Goim, when they get close to the Midianim, Hashem says this has to stop. And we see that we have nowadays a Magifa. And I'd like to say that maybe, maybe, it's also for the high number of Jews that are off the derech. Jews that have intermarried are not, not associated, they don't have God in their life, their children don't have God in their life, they're already second, third generation American or in the diaspora, and instead of getting closer to Kadosh Baruch Hu, they slowly but surely have become Gentiles. At the end of the day, they're God's children. Beni Bechori, HaKadosh Baruch Hu calls the Jewish people, Beni Bechori, you are my firstborn. Anybody who is a father or a mother who is a parent and has children will let you know nobody wants to lose a child. Regardless of how it happens. Hashem doesn't want to lose a child to assimilation and to intermarriage. He doesn't want it. Hashem wants those children back. And maybe those people through what's going on in the world, maybe they'll search their Jewish roots. Maybe they'll search God. Maybe they'll come back to Kadosh Baruch Hu. But if not, the wrath of God comes quickly. Maher. Intermarriage and assimilation, the numbers are very high. 
higher than the Holocaust. What will stop the Magifa? What will stop Corona? Is when we start making our way back to Hashem, both far and near. We saw that uh, Pinhas, he gave us the formula. Stop the Magifa, stop the intermarriage, stop getting connected to Midianim, stop it right now. Boom, as soon as he stopped it, the Magifa stopped. If a person is just on his journey, stop now. If you're too far deep into it, make your way back. It's time to bring the honor back to Hashem. And in order to be successful, you always have to pray. Before you can be any sort of success, you have to pray for it first. You have to, have to plant a prayer before you go out into the world and try to manifest it. So here, today, for us, and for anybody who's here in this class, and for anyone in the world, the next time that you're in an Amidah, the first three berachot are very important. The second one, it says, Baruch Atah Hashem, Magen Avraham. What's Magen Avraham? The one who protects Avraham. And have in your mind, you know what's Magen Avraham? Protect us from intermarriage. That we should all be from the seed of Abraham. That we should all be connected to, to, to the patriarchs, to the Jews, to Am Yisrael. And think about that person that is off the derech. And try to bring him back. Because it's very, very important that we plant that prayer, plant that seed. And Be'ezat Hashem help anybody who's struggling with it. Because just like the rabbis gave us so many views of why we're going through this, I'd like to say that maybe this be an, an additional ingredient to what's going on. The world is in a mess right now. Any way that we can make it better, we could. And I do believe that this week's parasha and everywhere that we saw Hashem's reaction that followed with the plague, there was a way to stop it. And the latest one, Parashat Minchas, when it was about intermarriage, there was a way to stop it. There's a way to stop the Magifa. There's a way to stop it. And it, you know, I don't expect you to go out there and start a movement about stopping intermarriage. But I do expect you to start it with your own life. If you're listening, if you know someone, start right there. Make sure you don't fall for that trap. Make sure you don't fall for uh, intermarriage and assimilation. Hashem warned us about it. The women are very powerful. They have the power to sway you. Before you know it, you're, you're in a home with a Hanukkah bush and a Christmas tree. And you can't do nothing about it. And you're going to midnight masses and you're not fasting on Yom Kippur. It can happen like this. I know people like that. So make sure that it's not you. And if it's not you, then anybody that's around you. Furthermore, if you have the power to be more of an influencer, go into your community. Look around. You know the young guys, you see one guy is already dating the Maria, another one's dating the, the Olga, you know, it's not working out, go over there and make sure that maybe you can help him out. Okay, but Hashem, you found the Jewish one. But if you're out there and you see you're able to help somebody in the community, great. You have more power, you have more power, go help a, a larger group of people, the young ones, the older ones, more Join the movement, join people that are working towards, join uh, people that are doing Jewish uh, dating uh, events, so on and so forth. It's a serious thing. It's a serious thing and we need to make sure that we don't get lost in it. Especially nowadays when people are very, very uh, eager for, for not to socially distance themselves. They want to be connected. They want to feel another person. They want to have a connection with a human being. And everybody's desperate for attention, desperate for love, desperate for a connection. And you know, just when you're down, that's when you make the worst decisions. So try to stay strong during these times, not to give up, and keep the search for a good Jewish girl. And give you the Seat of the Shmaya to meet the right girl at the right time. And it should be uh, from Shorosh Nishmatchem and Bezat Hashem that we all dance together uh, under your chuppah with the Mashiach in the middle. Amen.